Hey, you want to get high, man? Now stimulate your mind. Get up, Chucky! What have we got here? A fucking comedian. Hey, Rojan Kim. Yeah, I may, but I sleep in. Ooh, I like that Kenny does it do the reclining thing. Can you like No, do no, it just, I just I've just been made fun of like relentlessly. I have a desktop, so I can't really change the angle of my camera. Gotcha. So everyone who uh, I talk to just sees my bed and and they love to make fun of it looking like a hospital bed or something. Like hospital beds are way more, you know, people people with like super comfy beds when they're dying get a hospital bed to like die in. <laughs> so I imagine those hospital beds have to be great. Yeah, you know, I bet they have like 1,000 thread count sheets and stuff, you know? You know let me put my headphones in so I oh, can yeah. get, get uh, feedback. Like, you know, some people like will be on my podcast and make sure I put the headphones in. I'll be like, nah, and then they will. And I'm like, oh, it does sound better. Um, it's unbelievable. They're not even, the, the cord's not even in my pocket and it still tangles. Uh, Man, we're going to be maybe the last generation who had to fuck with cords. I know. I think about, I think about all the things people like younger than us know nothing about tapes. Like tapes. Oh, remember the? Did you ever do the with the pencil in the? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm in a, I'm like a, I'm like a terrible fidgeter, so I almost ruined all of my tapes because like <laughs> anything, like stick my finger in that little hole. Um, That's what when, she said. Yep. When the Zoom link didn't work, and uh, and then I saw the Google Hangouts link, I was like, oh, because I rescheduled with Rojan, he's now downgrading me to a Google Hangout from yep. the Zoom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even recording it. I see, I see how it is. Yeah, we're just gonna, just gonna chat for an hour. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> no record. There's gonna be no record of this. Um, well, anyway, speaking of, uh, so welcome to the podcast. This is the Rojan Kimcast. Thank My you. guest today is Josh Edelman. He is, uh, he's a comedian. Well, how I met him was as a stand-up comic, but he's also a, a director, an editor, a filmmaker, yep. um, you know, all around. Um, well, he's an all around funny guy in many different mediums. Don't you have a, do you have a podcast too? Or I, I do, I start, I start a podcast. It's funny when you asked me to be on yours, I was just about to ask you to be on mine, but I think, I imagine yours does better than mine because mine does horrifically. Um, well, I mean, by if you mean by does better, my aunt listens to every single one. Then yeah, man. <laughs> oh well, well, you're. I'm about my to bring aunt. my mom into your podcast. Yeah. She listens Hell yeah. to every podcast I do. Hey, that's um, what I'm all about. I'm just trying to connect to uh, just the older women who raised us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's all. funny. I started a podcast. I, I, I wanted to start a podcast for a long time, and then you know I, I used uh, this as an excuse to start one, uh -huh. um, like many others. Okay. But I always think it's funny, like all the people who like make fun of the people for starting podcasts right now. Like you know, actually, like go ahead, make fun of anyone for anything. Yeah, I'm whatever. Totally yeah, yeah. fine with it. But I'm also at the same time like, yeah, aren't you way cooler doing nothing? Right. <laughs> um, right. I mean, I think it's funny. It is funny to be like, ah, there's a million podcasts now and who needs a fucking podcast or whatever. But as soon as you have a good podcast, everybody's going to be fucking asking you to be on it. You know what I mean? Like, it's I'm, like get, I'm getting, it's, it's weird. I'm like, I don't even have a good one and I'm getting like tons you, of requests. Exactly. Cause that's all we have right now. I mean, yeah. honestly, podcasting is probably the most honest form of comedy we have given the circumstances. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've often like, said my like my stand up goal is to be my podcast self. Oh, dude, that would be amazing. Yeah, that is actually. I mean, for people who understand what that means, <laughs> most people they have no idea what the fuck that means. But like, like but but yeah, that, exactly. There's a level of authenticity you get to reach in the podcast mm -hmm. medium that's just like. It's actually really not even appropriate in stand up, right? Really. Well, it, well, it's funny. Um, like you know, I've done I've done some Zoom shows, and like my Zoom shows are basically, you know, I, I feel like it's so pointless to talk about almost anything that's happened pre any of my pre pandemic material because like, I don't know, like what, well, like <laughs> uh, turtles and straws. Who gives a fuck about turtles anymore? Who's still trying to save the fucking turtles at that's, this point? Um, mm -hmm. So like turtle bit done done that mm -hmm. was like a staple bit for me uh but i've got like i've got like 20 solid new minutes of material that i came up with almost like 90 percent of through my podcast and like 10 percent on twitter oh yeah man yeah i mean and i think whatever helps you write 
You know what I mean? You got to fucking utilize and whatever. I don't know. Haters are funny because it's the easiest. This is the lowest bar of entry as a pastime on the internet. You know what I mean? Like, I all also you have like to do, being a hater, though. I mean, me too. It's awesome. <laughs> like, I mean, they can't, can't lie. I mean, I can't lie about it. But I also do understand that, like, every hater is a hypocrite. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody oh, who totally. gets, including me, you know what I mean? Like, everybody is absolutely, because absolutely. our right as Americans. Huge hypocrite. Yeah, Huge exactly. hypocrite. You kidding me? Like, I don't care about, I care, I say I care about people's lives and yet I, the, my entire lifestyle hinges on exploiting African and I, children. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I remember, I remember going into Trader Joe's one day for no other reason than to get a free coffee sample and a free whatever food sample they have. And there was like some homeless guy in front of me doing the exact same thing as me. And I was just sitting behind, I was just behind him like, get this piece of shit loitering asshole out of here. <laughs> just yeah, coming, in, this coming, guy. coming in for a freebie. Son of a bitch. <laughs> At least I could afford stuff in here if I wanted to. Yeah. Maybe I will buy this. <laughs> <laughs> and then just throw it in the trash out of principle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like... <laughs> um, no, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's to me what is actually most... Um, something that's both hilarious and, and kind of sad about watching comedians like turn on each other and just become kind of moralistic and take these like sort of, I mean, become very serious. You know, they start taking themselves very seriously and being like, you should do this and you should do that. And it's just like, this is sort of like really not the, you know, part of the job description at all. Like if you really want to be a comedian and it's kind of weird to suddenly be like, I'm, I'm good and you should listen to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, cause then you become the object of ridicule you should become the object of ridicule now mm -hmm. <laughs> right like because i get you know, I don't know. I don't well know. i also find it funny you know i always think like like it, you know even I'll, I'll make digs at them but like like i always think it's interesting when people try to make digs at like prop comics or musical comics i'm like whatever makes people if it's funny it's funny who cares yeah. how you do it it feels almost like uh like an insecurity from the person who likes to make fun of the prop comedy. Right. I mean, there's plenty of reasons to make fun of Carrot Top outside of his prop comedy. Right. Uh, like his muscles. Yeah, like but his body you dysmorphia. Get, you get those muscles. You get those yeah, muscles. Yeah, exactly. Carrot Top fucking works hard, both on his prop comedy <laughs> and his bodybuilding, all right? And you're nowhere near, most people are nowhere near that dedicated to either. I remember uh, my first time in Vegas, I was uh, at the Luxor, you know, the it's the Black Pyramid. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was on acid <laughs> with my friends. And um, I remembered having this thought while I was there, like, um, <clears throat> that, uh, like, while I was on acid, I was, like, in this pool. And I'm like, oh, it's like heaven. And then, like, I got kicked out of the pool because it was a private pool I was in. <laughs> and as I was walking over to the public pool, there was a giant billboard for Carrot Top and Chris Angel and like, just like the heat <laughs> rising and I was like this is <laughs> I was like this isn't this isn't heaven. Imagine imagine an eternity spent where the only entertainment is Carrot Top and Chris Angel. Oh man. It's hard to I don't know. I don't know if that's hell necessarily either though. You know I'm saying that might yeah, just be purgatory. Yeah. It might just hell be would be hell hell would be an eternity where the the only entertainment is uh some open micer and a kid's birthday party magician. <laughs> right. <laughs> At least they're pros. And honestly, that probably would be me. It would be, <laughs> it would be like me <laughs> watching me <laughs> as a terrible comic at some birthday party. You, you, I, I think I've told you this before, but like when I got back into stand up and what I really consider like the first time I like ever approached stand up correctly, um, you, I thought was the funniest comedian at one of the very first mics. I, uh, I went to when I came back and I was like, man, I hope to one day be as good as that guy. And then like two weeks later, I was there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you realize that like, you, oh my God, that guy sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, when was, when did you, so you started comedy. I think we talked about this before. You started comedy and then you took a break, right? And then you came back. I, like, I, like, I like did comedy and then like I stopped for like 10 years. Right. And then like, or like eight years. And then I, came back like I like tried it again after I made my doc like in 2016 right afterwards I like started doing it for like a couple weeks then Trump won and I 
I just got depressed and I stopped doing everything. <laughs> and then, uh, and then a year and a half ago, I guess it would be two years in September. Um, so, so more than a year and a half ago at this oh, point. Oh, that's when you decided to like start grinding, like doing mics and shit, grinding mics yeah. and shit. Okay. Yeah. And then, gotcha. but like, 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 you know, I'd always, when I'd done it before, I'd be like, I did one this week. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm And like, literally got to a point where I was averaging probably, I think like when I looked at my recordings, I averaged like two and a half a day. Oh, wow. Well, it's so obviously you were, cause I saw you had a reel, um, I saw your reel and stuff and like you, so obviously you were like in the comedy world. We have a lot of similarities in that way because like I came, I like moved to New York to do film basically. I worked as an editor. Okay. And oh, okay. I, I lived in New York for eight years before coming Yeah, yeah. So I worked, there, so I lived there for 12 and I uh, went to Columbia for film school and then made- Oh, like, nice. They let you make like- two Undergrad pieces. or grad school? Uh, grad. Grad school. What year? Yeah, what yeah. year were you there? Uh, 2005 to 10. So okay. Sort of... Do you know, uh, probably you don't, you don't know Brian Love, do you? No. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. They were, we were very, um, Columbia is weird. They insulate every year from each other. So okay. like it's super intense within the year, but nobody barely has any idea of whoever is in another. I almost went to Columbia. I went to NYU. I, went, I chose NYU. Instead. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. But, I consider, been but, but under, but both, been. both were undergrad. Um, oh, I did undergrad? Not do grad okay. School. Gotcha. Okay. Um, it's for the bad. Don't go to grad school. <laughs> don't do it. Well, actually, yeah, there's a part of me. To, unless you want to. Maybe there's a part fine. of me that regrets doing film undergrad and not doing something else undergrad okay, and then I going to that. film grad school. Yeah, I yeah, think I that I think that. the grad programs uh, at both colleges put a lot more care into their grad programs than than the undergrad programs. Not that the undergrad at NYU wasn't cool and had its advantages, mm -hmm. but also I probably recommend not spending that money. That's school. that's all I was gonna say. I was like, <laughs> just make a movie, man. Just make your movie. You know, make what if you have the money, then do that. Or it's like there's a lot of other. It's sort of like um, it was a dying paradigm when I was in it. You know what I mean? That whole film school, film festival model, and now it's, I don't see it surviving this. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. This is this is. I mean, like it was already going downhill. I, I would say though that weirdly, the the two biggest things I took out of out of film school. Um, and the two reasons why I, I actually appreciate NYU and they're, and they're actually weird things to appreciate about mm -hmm. it was um, one, well, one is just that I feel like, let's say my life didn't work out or doesn't work out, but let's say I didn't go and my life also didn't work out. <laughs> there might've been a part of me that's always like, well, what if I had, done the thing I'd always dreamed about doing. Yes. I, thought. Totally. I, don't, I don't, you know, it's like, it's like I've eliminated, I've eliminated that regret, created yes. a new one, but at least it's the new one where yes. I know. Exactly. Um, and the other aspect of it for me is simply that NYU taught me how to make a movie with no help. Just, just nobody's going to help you. Nobody's going to give you anything. Happy to take your money and then say, go raise some more to make your own thing. Yeah, no, I'm actually totally with you. I, I feel like it was an invaluable experience and I would have regretted it forever had I never done it. Um, I mean, could it have been cheaper? Sure. <laughs> could it have been a little cheaper? Sure. But, uh, but, but besides that, yeah, yeah, like I credit, like Columbia was, um, one of the things that kind of, uh, I guess is a positive or a negative about Columbia is that like, there's like no technical nothing, like the ex. The basic expectation is that you're just above the line and you'll just hire everybody. That's pretty much it. You know, it, it really is. It's like, it's like a place where it's just like, we don't even, I don't know what a C-stand is, but the group you hire will. Okay? And that's all you need to know. Like, so that's pretty much the attitude going in. And which I don't think is a bad attitude for when you're um, sort of aiming for above the line. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, there's only so much you're going to get out of um, learning all the equipment like like it's much more much better for you to just fucking get on a set than like you know go through this technical stuff but on the other hand people are like like you know how to make a movie by yourself a lot of these people my classmates they know how to hire people who can make movies by the you know what i'm saying like they're not but but the focus was i will say narrative it was like 100 percent narrative it was which like, i also which i also really appreciate like like yeah. you know going there i got to learn I got to really like, like the focus was on theoretical filmmaking right. rather yeah, yeah, than yeah. 
more so than technical filmmaking and i yeah. love having that theory like like storytelling and and yeah. and uh meaning and 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 all these things and just drama. that like you yeah. don't get at a technical college i also look at a lot of lots of people i know who went to usc and not that i think this is worse maybe this is even better you know that school is so focused on teaching a studio model that oh, like yeah. most of them i know are really focused on like going through like getting it through the system and, and right. they they have a better knowledge of getting their thing through the system than me but i also am very much an independent minded uh, right type of filmmaker i don't i look at like the script i'm writing about a kid's birthday magician going through an existential crisis that has eight dream sequences in it and i'm like i don't know if warner brothers is buying <laughs> yeah, and you don't necessarily want like these executives to be like, okay, instead of a magician, what if he was um, he worked for Lyft? Because let, yeah. you know, like they start changing it a little bit. Like, let's make it a little hip. Let's little. Can he be trans? Like you know stuff like that. <laughs> like uh, you know. So I think I I actually. Wait, when did you go? When did you go? What year were you in NYU? Uh, oh three to oh seven. Oh, so that's. See, to me, I think, to me, that's sort of like peak NYC to me. Is, there, is that late Bush, that sort of second Bush term of NYC? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carrie was, lost while I was there. Yeah. And, and... Like, to me, the high point of comedy, to me, comedy and culture, like, in New York was that second Bush term, first Obama term, sort of like eight-year period. Like mm -hmm. to me, I don't know, for some reason that was like just a big, so that's a, that was a wonderful time, I'm sure, for you to be there, that post 9-11 period, because like when I came in, it was 2004. Well, um, in a way, in a way, but at the same time, it's like, it's literally like I graduated on like the day of the financial crisis. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so but like yeah, jobs yeah. just yeah, no jobs. didn't yeah. exist. Like I, I, I went into, I remember um, I was living in this five story Chinatown walk up with like ah. three other people. Um, and it was like the dead of winter. I had no job. Um, I'm, I'm like, like sleeping in till, like, you know, I decided to read Crime and Punishment, uh, Dostoevsky, oh, while yeah, I was great, there. Great choice. Yeah, good choice. And it was amazing because I remember like the first, three chapters reading the book and being like this is about like a man in russia who's like about to commit murder and like it, it feels like he's writing about my life right now. yeah like i my life couldn't mirror this more exactly yeah like yeah, he's yeah. like i walked up i woke up in my tiny apartment i couldn't stand up in my room i'd like walk down the stairs into the cold uh, i had no purpose for anything. <laughs> and I was like, am I going to kill someone? I really don't feel like I am, but like I am relating way too hard to this character right now. Oh yeah. I felt that way. I read notes from underground and it was similar. There's a whole diatribe about this guy who refuses to see the doctor out of spite. He's mm -hmm. like, I don't care. He's like, you know what? He's like, I don't give a fuck. Good. If I'm dying, fine. What do I need to go to some doctor and tell me <laughs> I'm dying? <laughs> like, I'm going to have another drink because of that <laughs> like like and i was just like yeah i get it this guy <laughs> it's interesting you know culturally like that period yeah for me it was like you know i'm actually the, one of the nice one of the nicest things about the quarantine for me is um i guess like i'm i'm very like like um all in with whatever i'm doing so like over the course of the past year almost two years of doing stand-up film really took like a back seat for me i wasn't even really watching movies yeah. at all i would like pretty much exclusively watch stand-up specials and stand-up clips and like i was just hyper focused and like just like the effective end of stand-up <laughs> just uh -huh. the immediate like end of stand-up you know i'm really back into like screenwriting and stuff and uh every night i've been trying to watch uh like what would be considered a great movie or like a movie from a great filmmaker that's yeah. lesser known or something that yeah, I hadn't yeah, yeah. seen and just like repeat. And I was thinking like the last period of my life like that was really those uh, college to post-college years where I was like 
pouring into like foreign films and stuff yeah. and reading things like Dostoevsky and yep. Kafka and Faulkner and just like like what are the cla like what are what were the origins of like of like everything that's supposedly good today. I think people don't put enough credit into learning the things that created the things they like. Yeah, and you know, I, I don't think they ever really did, even back then, you know what I mean? Even back then, it wasn't like everybody was like super appreciative of all the class, you know what I mean? I'm sure the mm -hmm. majority of people are like, who gives a fuck? And like, if you really think about the majority of the art and culture that everybody knew back in the past is probably completely lost to us because it was all just like fluff. You know what I mean? It was all just like everyday sort of fluff. It's not gonna last the test of time, but it would probably was the most popular shit, like Twilight or whatever back then, you know? <laughs> we, would have, we would have no idea, you know, we have no idea about that stuff. So it's that, I mean that, you know, but I, you know what, dude, it's actually very similar um, to me where, uh, yeah, post-college to the grad through grad school was like, heavily heavy film like cinema watching shit and like and then like inside of film school i just kept making comedies like that's all i just kept making me and too Trump i mean my, my thesis is literally a 15 minute blowjob joke ah oh, that's hilarious mine is like a 15, <laughs> it's a 15 minute um terminator parody essentially <laughs> and that's basically all mine I is werewolves blowjob south florida um it's a uh, uh it's a wild movie i mean i wish i was a little bit more technically proficient, but uh, I still, I still love it. Oh, I'm sure it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, mine was essentially um, extended homoerotic, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like veiled racist. <laughs> like a, and essentially a kind of a fuck you to the, like the, I, not really a fuck you, but I was just like, I didn't really care about, um, they have this like whole faculty selects. And so, so, you know, one of the things that actually really turned me off to film was, um, like Columbia was the first uh, non-public school I'd ever gone to. It was public school my whole life until Columbia. And I was like really big culture shock, like very different, <laughs> like incredibly different. I couldn't believe how different it was. Like just the, like, okay, for instance, I went to Berkeley. I went to Berkeley for uh, uh, undergrad and it's public. And Berkeley is just basically like, look, here's our, our their financial aid department is just the like, one the oh berkeley berkeley berkeley, berkeley. berkeley california well, there's a part of me that was like brandeis and i was about no. to say like i was like about to say the good school where it's even more jews than asians right <laughs> the one but berkeley's, probably, berkeley, berkeley's yeah. probably berkeley's probably 50 50 to skewing uh asian <laughs> yeah no 80 more like 80 20. <laughs> but like uh dude like like if you needed financial aid in Berkeley, they had something called an emergency loan for every student where you could just come in and be like, I need an emergency loan. And they'd be like, here you go. And if you uh, needed financial aid, it was so easy and helpful, whatever. Fucking Columbia basically shames you as soon as you enter the financial <laughs> Office. It's, uh, like, it's, well, it's New York, the most aggressively it's, capitalistic city on the planet. But then on top of that, you know, make it Columbia, which is the snobbiest snobs of that capital. And so by the time I got, here's what happened, man. So again, at the end of uh, film school where they were doing the award ceremony and all this shit, so there's this big award where you're basically like funded, your movie's like funded, like you're getting like a hundred grand or some shit, you're just getting your shit. And they fucking, and the person they gave it to was the daughter of Sony Pictures Classics, who, who was like, a, okay, Phil, I mean, she was had nothing, you know what I mean? It was like, no real, like, why are you? And when she got the check in the ceremony, she had this check, like a little oversized, whatever, it was like a big deal. She's just, I feel like, like, it's just not a, you know what I mean? Because it doesn't mean anything to this. She doesn't be like, her thesis is probably more than a hundred grand. Like that, she did. you know what I'm saying? Because her dad, she literally ran, ran, her dad came to our school and talked about like, here's what we're doing. <laughs> so he pictures classics now. Last independent he studio. He probably gave like, them the hundred grand to give exactly, to her. Exactly, to give to her. Yeah, exactly. So that's when I was just like, oh, Jesus Christ. You know, like it turned me off a lot to sort of like, and this is supposed to be the, the independent film center of the world. You know what I mean? This is supposed to be outside of, you know, that's supposed to value the art or whatever. And I was just like, eh. So, you know, I think I was just hit with it 
lot of sinister. Yeah, but you didn't, you didn't think your Terminator 2 parody was going to be the one that <laughs> landed. No, 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 but there were like at least five other people who really should have gotten, you know what I mean? Totally, like, totally. Who, like really should have gotten. Me, on the other hand, was like, why didn't my blowjob film win the uh, festival? <laughs> 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 oh, I forgot. Well, the funniest oh, yeah. thing is um, at the screening for my South Florida werewolf blowjob sex comedy thriller. Um, the movie that played right before it uh -huh. was this black and white movie about this daughter <laughs> confronting her dad who died of AIDS for like secretly carrying on a homosexual affair on his mother for her whole life and then like getting sick and dying of AIDS and just like like him in bed and her oh. confronting him yeah. for like ruining her life or whatever. Okay. And then and then my blowjob and then like right after that my blowjob sex comedy starts. I, I actually think it, it helped it helped actually my, yeah that's what I was gonna say. I it think cut it, the tension it like people yeah. people were just dying for anything not that. Yeah like, they were like oh thank God <laughs> Oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> it was probably the biggest breath of fresh air. I mean, like, that's it actually- was like Bergman style, like side frames oh, of their Jesus. face. Essentially, you were like um, the musical act at a tribal cafe, Mike. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You were just a big, big old breath of fresh air for the audience. <laughs> just people were just like, oh, God. <laughs> I was God. the blender in the middle of a bad comic set. <laughs> you're just saying, you're there. To, you're the real hero here, man. Yeah. I, bet the, I, I bet you it really did work in your favor. And oh, 100%, usually, 100%. I bet it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. I mean, part of me does miss the fucking god awful student films like the years and years of you know what i mean like i just watched so many bad shorts i mean just like the years and years of bad comedy because now i'm nine years in now so i was actually gonna say yeah, yeah yeah so when i first started comedy i was similar i was like the first two three years i didn't do shit i didn't like fucking look at movies i didn't think about movies or whatever but eventually it starts coming back you start like figuring out how to incorporate the two but i think for me like one of the things i realized was that what comedy did was like to me comedy is like the crack version of art like what i was oh, getting out of totally, film. totally you know what i mean so it's like it's less sad film is such a long burn and the satisfaction comes at the end and you have something permanent but it's just the, the crack of comedy is just like boom, well boom, and boom, also boom, if yeah. you have a bad joke you find out like that night you have a bad movie yeah. you find out five years later <laughs> oh god yeah exactly <laughs> I th that, that's actually <laughs> well. That's funny. One of the things that got me to stand up was I kept making shorts after charge uh, after school and like an idiot charging into my credit card and fucking just maxing Ooh. out. I maxed the fuck out of my credit cards just making these stupid comedy shorts. And then eventually I was like, I think I'm just fucking writing premises and then spending thousands of dollars shooting them when I could just go on stage and check these premises out. You know what I mean? Like I think that was sort of the the thing that took me into stand up and 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 so i think getting through that whole thing like like the the idea that i want to make a movie and stuff is still in there but i feel like a lot of things are kind of um satisfied by comedy but at the same time the com doing actual um stand -up comedy is sharpening it's only sharpening you in terms of writing and also if you really think about it stand -up comedy is just directing it's just real time totally. directing. you know what i mean it's just real time mental directing yeah, you're absolutely, just putting images absolutely. in people's minds. You're setting up shots. It's punch. Well, there's know, such punch a, I mean, I mean, really, like the the best thing is when you when you really reach like the heights of it. When you really like like get to that place, the you know, it's funny because I often say like like stand up is a lot like uh, like working out, dieting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just in that like. You, it's not you never like wake up one morning and you're like I'm in shape. But then I wasn't in shape yesterday. Right. It's like over time, you just start to notice like, hey, I look better. And right. it's, it's like, it's weird because like, you never really notice yourself like being better at stand up. You just think back to where you were like two months ago and you go like, hey, I'm better than I was. I'm, I'm like better. And like, it just, there come these moments where like, you know, I just remember like early on in my like coming back to it, I'd have my notebook on stage, even though I didn't even need to look at it, I just look at it for like the reassurance of it being there to like see what the next joke I was gonna do. Yeah. To the point where like you get you get on stage and it's like I'm live editing. 
I'm right. like speaking and it, it's like I'm on autopilot talking and in my head, I'm like doing a whole formula about what I'm going to say next. Yeah, um, it's fucking awesome. Yeah. And so it's, it's hard, I think, to um, like for some people, the only satisfaction they get is like making films. So like that, that relief you're getting just from that. That's yeah, exactly. Like you're saying, it'll take them years to find out that like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> like, it, that is, it is the best though. Like, like I made a doc, which is coming out soon. It is actually, it is actually on its way to coming out. Oh yeah. Wait, um, what's it about? What's it about? It's about a comedian. Do you know who Al Lubell is? Do you know, did I ever talk to you about my doc? No. Wait, I know Al Lubell. Why do I know that? I know the name, but I don't know. He's, he's a comic. Uh, he's, in my opinion, he's probably my favorite comedian. Okay. Um, underground legend. Uh -huh. uh, people, um, people like, you know, Sarah Silverman, Kevin Nealon, Andy yeah, Kindler. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, all like they just love them. Did the doc for like free for me. Oh, to, fuck. Uh, oh, okay. Because of how much they like Al. Yeah. I mean, he's like I've always described him. It's funny. So I've described Al as like an Andy Kaufman met Jerry Seinfeld. It's mm. like this weird like oh that's funny mixed with like logical funny things, mm -hmm. uh, which he says is apparently a combination that leads to no success. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just I was wanting to make a special for him just because I'm like you haven't had a special. He's like in his sixties now. Um, and then I just, in doing that, I just shot I just the documentary. Shot. It took me like, oh, that's awesome. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's the proudest I've ever been of anything I've done. And like the big screening I had that like filled out with like him there, definitely one of the greatest moments of my life, just getting oh. to see a whole room full of people actually really enjoying a feature length movie I've spent years making. Fuck yeah, man. Um, Hell yeah. But he's like, you know, it's just a very interesting story because he's like, anyone who like truly like is a real comic, Al's undeniable to them. Uh, he's just undeniable. He's just the uh -huh. funniest fucking person. Um, and uh, it's just kind of this film. He's like, you know, at, in his 60s, he's been on The Tonight Show and Letterman and Carson like seven times each. And he's like sleeping on people's couches. Um, and it's just like, uh, I don't know, just, I just thought it was an interesting look at kind of what this career means mm -hmm. and like what not being willing to sacrifice your integrity looks like. Uh, not that that's the reason he's not doing better. No, movie. but it is a, but, it's, it's an interesting theme. Like, you know what I mean? It's an interesting thing to explore. Um, mental illness. Um, well, and, hey, look, uh, listen, that's, uh, you know, Patrice O'Neill is another example of, you know, so, but I mean, and it's not to say he's dead because of it, but it's like toward the end of his life, he was starting to express regrets of like, you know, maybe I should have, you know, like, and he's one of the greatest comedians ever. You know what I mean? He's, Patrice is by far one of the greatest comedians because of his uncompromising. There's, there's a, there's a podcast where Patrice O'Neill and this other comedian, I forget his name, are uh -huh. arguing about their favorite uh, five comedians in New York. And Patrice is arguing with the other comic that Al Lubell shouldn't be on his list. <laughs> 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 you know but that's that's the thing is like he was just it doesn't matter if he was right or wrong it's just that he was righteous right like he was well, well, one of the, one of the things patrice says about al in the argument is he goes al to me is like this like homeless man standing outside talking to god trying to find out what comedy is <laughs> <laughs> You know, and then and, and and well, well, look where he is now. <laughs> <laughs> Al's arguably doing better than Patrice yeah. right now. <laughs> Maybe we've got the documentary, <laughs> huh? Who's got a documentary? <laughs> so there, Patrice. Who's, whose documentary would have sold much easier for a lot more money? <laughs> yeah, you never know. I mean, you never know. You never know. <laughs> they, 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 um. But anyways, well, that's fucking awesome. I can't. When is it coming out? When's the document? Uh, I don't have an exact date yet, but I'm okay. but I'm actually I've, I'm officially. I'm like in the process of delivering it to the company that's, I don't want to say bought it from me, it's taking it from me <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to put it out yes. there so it can make money. I mean, I got a little bit of money. 
So you um, got a, so you got a distributor and shit. And I have a distributor. And it's awesome, coming dude. out, but uh, dates aren't dates aren't official yet. All right, uh, and then platforms. Is, so you'll it figure is out. Happening. It and is you'll happening. you'll figure out all that stuff as yeah, like. Yeah. So all right, cool. So then you'll let. Every, it's okay. I I have a bit about it um, where I say like you hear a lot of filmmakers talk about their kids like it's their baby. Mm -hmm. their films like it's their baby you know mm -hmm. i don't think of my movie as my baby anymore i now think of it as the adult man child i'm ready to move out of the house and stop costing <laughs> me money right it's like well, i it? love you but i don't want to see you for a long time <laughs> well that's like the uh, uh the other saying right it's like films are never finished they're abandoned Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I made a web series a year after i released the web series i re-edited parts of it and and put it back out for no reason. I added a sound effect to, uh -huh. to an episode. <laughs> and then um, re-export everything. <laughs> re-export re every, the whole, the whole yeah. uh, <laughs> because of the psychopath. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I tell people all the time that like I'm doing editing stuff for or whatever. I'm like, you know, at a certain point, you just, you just have to be done because you never will. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah. I That's remember I, wor I worked in uh, post-finishing. Uh, oh, like, yeah. um, and I always wanted to do, I always had this like sociological experiment I wanted to like test out because uh, I would have like um, the clients would be in the room and we'd be spending weeks to months on like a commercial, um, usually days, but, but, but it can get real intense for some of the big ones. Um, and I always wanted to like do a thing where I showed a regular person a before and after the week's work, oh, work and right. see if they could tell me what was different. Nah, probably. See if they could highlight, <laughs> tell me <laughs> like, like they, you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah, yeah. on this. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what hundreds of thousands of dollars was spent on? No, no. Yeah, of course not. I mean, the majority of people still can't tell the difference between like 720p and 4k, you know, you know what I mean? Like they're just like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's clear. You know, like they're, just, they're not gonna, they don't care about color depth and all that. You know, that's like a, well, uh, yeah. It is always funny, you know, I always go, there's an emotional arc that I always go through when I look at something first colored where I hate it. But then all I need to do to love it is look at what it looked like right before. Look at what the thing that my eyes were completely used to and totally accepting of looked like the minute before I adjusted the blacks a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, so it does make a difference. I think the appropriate term now is people of color. You know, I don't, really <laughs> say, <laughs> I don't say that anymore, man. <laughs> I don't say that, just, but, but I understand. Right before I roto them out of my film. <laughs> yeah, um. <laughs> just like, just like a Chinese guy hired you to. <laughs> just like, have you ever seen that? This was, uh, I found out about this on the- uh, Yeah, it's podcast. called, it's literally called Crush the Blacks. Yeah. That's literally the term. <laughs> okay. That's literally That's the filmmaking that. term. <laughs> for adding it's term, depth uh, to them. Yes, it's borrowed from colonialism. Uh, but <laughs> it's, a, it's an age old technique. Now, did you know about, I learned about this on Kurt Metzger's podcast. That, so the Chinese version of um, whatever the new Star Wars was, not the, the first one, the, la, the fucking goddamn Force Awakens. Force they Awakens. had uh, John Boyega photoshopped out. Oh, yeah, 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 I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> and I was just like, whose job is that? And well, that well, I made, I produced uh, this series of commercials for this company. I won't, I won't out them since they paid me a lot of money. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Right. but it was like a bunch of families doing like, um, like, like a bunch of families using the product. Uh -huh. And for the commercial, we just made like a diverse range of families. We had an African American family, an Asian family, a white family. We sent them the commercial, and then they asked us to reshoot the black family with another white family. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, a lot of times it's like I used to work in advertising and shit. It's like they have all this data, you know, like a lot of it is just data driven, where they're like, we're focusing on these are the demographics, we're focusing, you know what I mean? Where there it's like, it's, I, in some ways, I would prefer them to be racist because at least that's human. You know what I mean? <laughs> at least that's, there's some humanity to, because otherwise it's just like, they're like, um, according to this, we're hitting this quadrant and this quadrant. You know, it, it's well, like. Well, definitely, definitely something that makes me sad about like the nature of the intense political correctness right now is it's really truly just like sucked all the humor out of advertising because like 
Pete, like the, the producers and the agency people are so terrified of yeah. getting in trouble that like the style, like, like not, not that like anything like really wrong should be put in them. But, like, the vanilla-ness of commercials is, like, the result of not wanting to do anything that challenges the way right. you think about it, I think. Yeah. I remember I worked, like, maybe the funniest one. I cannot remember. It's, like, maybe it's, like, Travelocity or something. It was just this Super Bowl ad that, um, <laughs> that like, we were, like, like, there was no choice but to go with what it was because we were, like, a day away from the Super Bowl, and this was what the ad was. Uh, and it was like this guy, fuck, I can't, like, um, like talking about like the Malaysian mountains and everything, and like, and it's like, and then just cuts to him, he's in a Malaysian restaurant. It's like, and you won't believe, like, I, I forget, I forget what happens, but like, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. kind of racist a little bit. But right, it was but also a very funny commercial. But the and joke is got, that that guy is an idiot, right? Yeah, the joke is clearly got, that guy's an idiot. Yeah, they yeah. all got fired. They You're all fired. got fired. You're out of here. So it's just <laughs> like, Holy shit. Well, like the style of humor is like this. Like this random person talks weird, but not, not right. like because they talk in like an Asian voice. My voice is like this. Like right. <laughs> that's that's what a commercial is now. Well, it was essentially now all improv humor. It's yeah. like it's a it's like safe, like kind of intellectual, kind of upper class twit humor that like no, you know. One of my like, favorite, oh, one of my favorite Jeremy McKiernan jokes um, is he goes, uh, he talks about how he used to do improv, and he's like, yeah, when you're doing improv, it's like uh, you'll see a white guy will play an Italian person, I'll be like, ah, hello, welcome to my restaurant day. And then later in the sketch, they'll play an Asian person. Like, hello, I'm a Chinese man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, and uh, I don't know. I, um, in some ways, I kind of like that comedy has become, because uh, like, like, like what you would then call real comedy or whatever then becomes like dangerous, right? It becomes like, oh no, you, they're saying the words you're not allowed to say, and they're saying, they're talking about, things and say having opinions that you know like it becomes a rep which i think it should be like i think there was a really great thing that happened with uh the john stewart daily show era like sort of being the counter push to the uh, counter like like being pushing back against the bush sort of administration and the journalism that was going mm -hmm. on then uh but i think the downside of was that that energy became mainstream you know what i mean like that's sort of like we are now the it, and it became almost instead of a court jester sort of um position it kind of became like they became the minister of information <laughs> you well, know totally I mean? totally it feels like, <laughs> like 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 uh you know it was interesting like there was a period during like the early portion of the trump administration where like i legitimately just got my news from watching seth myers at night yeah um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> there's literally all there's no just almost no distinguishing them now Did, like mm -hmm. i feel like i might as well you might i might as well get my news from it was it yeah. was interesting for me i had like a moment a um a weird moment where like when the al franken thing happened really feeling for the first time like i was not on board with what seth myers was like like his perspective on it because yeah. I, I was i was like oh it, it's interesting i feel i feel very much like the al franken moment was the moment where politically the me too movement got too confused and messed up and like ruined the uh ruined in politics the, right. especially the combo between franken and then um and then the supreme court guy uh yeah well and then let's just throw joe biden on top of that now <laughs> <laughs> right like like I, it's, it's just like <laughs> it's all it's all just like the biggest mess and now it's just and, like total bullshit you're like you guys are all bullshit aren't you <laughs> like, well it's just like it's like to me you know to me i really like look at i mean genuinely at this point i feel like the veil is lifted especially on republicans that like they're to me they're just evil like i like there was there was a part of me that used to feel like there was like a black and whiteness to, like that there wasn't a black and whiteness to like anything and now i'm just like no they're like like i used to watch i remember not liking pan's labyrinth that much because i felt like the villain in pan's labyrinth was just too cartoonishly evil 
Now I like Pan's Labyrinth because I'm like, never mind. It's pretty accurate to how bad people are. <laughs> like, I feel like Trump just kind of gave them the, the, like, gave them the liberty to just be as bad as they are, mm. um, where they had to, like, pretend like they were better than that. Um, but simultaneously, <laughs> like, just... I, I just cannot stand the eating ourselves of the left. I, I and and just the 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 hypocrisy. I mean, I'm a person that like I just hate Republicans so much. I'll vote for whatever the most viable, better, bad option is. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely uh, like. I'm definitely yeah. angry. I'm definitely. Oh, yeah. like, angry. And as well, you should be. Here's the thing, though. I am angry and old, so. I, <laughs> I remember a lot of that. Here's the thing. It's like I kind of went through this thing when um, uh, George Bush, George W. Bush was this close to being impeached for war crimes, torture, and all that. And then Nancy Pelosi was like, you know, and we're not going we're, we're to do that. <laughs> was like, we're not going to do that. You know, and that's when like everything kind of, that's why I was saying that second Bush term, that's why a lot of things kind of turned. And even like, that's when the Book of Mormon came out and a lot oh, of comedy was so just like, good. it was just like, they didn't give a fuck at that point because it was clear both sides turned against us and everybody was like, fuck the authority. Because remember, we had basically gone through like four or five years, you were there, like of being like the state is good, every America is good, canceled the Dixie Chicks for him criticizing Bush. You know what I mean? Like it was just a lot of like pro-America, pro-America. And then I think that's when the veil started lift, getting lifted after Abu Ghraib. Um, when nothing happened that like people were like and pelosi was speaker of the house at the time and she was supposed to be we're fighting the, their their whole stance was uh being against the iraq war and being against it so like for me i'm just saying for me personally that was my moment where i'm like oh geez these motherfuckers okay so then fast forward now to like when they're impeaching trump they're so they're now trump's in office they're fucking running impeachment in the house while they're doing that they motherfucking pass his entire legislative agenda while they're impeaching the guy. Like, it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, they passed the fucking, uh, gave, they expanded the Patriot Act, the NDAA, they fucking gave him his military budget, which is the biggest budget ever. They gave him the Space it's, Force. It's, you know, like, but they I'm, just capitulated I'm, on all this shit. So, I'm, so, I'm, I'm just saying, saying yeah, yeah no, I'm just saying I'm, that's I'm, the same lady. The same lady that did an impeachment, you know what I'm saying, is the same lady. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I, I will gladly, I will gladly put, I would gladly vote for someone better than Pelosi. Uh, I'd yeah, yeah. gladly have someone better than Pelosi in there, but I'd rather have Pelosi than Paul Ryan. Sure. It's just that little bit better. I mean, I just, like, like, to me, to me, well, and then another thing, like, like, I'll give you, I'll give you a huge difference for me between Bush and Trump, um, W and Trump. W? I, okay. I, I hated W. Right. I hated him. I, you know, I, I, at the end of W, I was like, whoo, survive the worst president I'm ever going to have to deal with. Right. Was, was my, was my genuine thought. Um, but and then America I, said, hold my beer. Hold my beer. <laughs> well, well, I think two, two huge things, two huge things. And, and it's, and one of them's never been more true than it is right now. Um, when Bush was president, I still walked around New York City and fantasized about my future and didn't think about it. <laughs> you know he yeah. didn't he didn't in, he didn't insert himself into my life every day um and i and i take that uh with trump like from the moment he won my future became cloudy and like never hazier than it is right now with like, like there's a part of me that's like maybe i'm gonna move to new zealand and just like open an open mic there and marry some chick and just live till i die in in, in there um <laughs> and give up on my dreams because like it, i'm starting to really feel like this country may legitimately be falling mm -hmm. like like for the first time truly just <clears throat> that the seams have come full apart and i think the big thing is um with trump with bush he attacked the world but trump attacked america i really feel like like trump attacked us i don't know it's like it's like it's like i think like a huge aspect of the anger that everyone feels and like all these movements and like the constant like like uh, cancel culture and all of this is every day you wake up and the president is bullying us and it's like 
Like we're already, we start moment one of our day. It's like, all right, I'm being bullied by the president. And it's just like, it's too much to take any more bullying from anyone else. It well, like, it becomes, yeah, yeah, it becomes yeah. overwhelming uh, so on I think, a daily um, basis. Yeah, so I think actually what you said was very prescient. You said, but under Bush, we attack the world. But under Trump, Trump is attacking us. And in a way, um, how I feel is that every president is really a mirror of America. You know what I'm saying? So every president we have is us. That's, that's us up there. You know what I mean? So if you take those two things that happen and kind of put them on a timeline, if you think about it, so we, yeah, we attack them. We fuck the world up. Not only that, under the next president, who is awesome, we all love. I love him. I love the guy. I know that he expanded two wars to seven, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I still love the guy. That's the thing. Like, well, no, I'm just saying, like, I'm not saying anything bad. I'm just I, saying, I, agree, I love the guy. I agree with you. I agree love with you. I think, I think there's an interesting thing that I think people really forget about being president. And yeah. I think it's like, is that it's not, it's not a race. It's a, it's a, it's a relay. Uh, right. It's right. like, You're it's passing like the baton. Obama, yeah. Obama didn't, didn't get handed a country that was like economically sound and not fighting any wars. He right. got handed a country that was in an economic recession and in the middle of two huge wars. That's, um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, but, it, but I, at I, the same, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, if you just took the people out and looked at it on paper, totally, totally. what you're looking at is a pretty tr strong trend. You know what I mean? Like from Bush to Obama to Trump, there's a trend of expanding uh, executive power. There's a trend of in wealth being extracted m more and more from the poor, transfers of wealth. Every president has undergone the largest transfer of wealth since Bush. So it's like Bush was the last one, and then Obama did one, and now Trump did one. And because there was a crisis and there was a- But also look at how much, look at how much the, the wealthy class freaked out about Obama doing literally the smallest thing for people. Like, yes. like the smallest thing for regular people, which which is which has been a thing. Like you know, I it, like Obamacare is legitimately one of the only things I can point to that any president has done that I have seen a direct benefit mm -hmm. to to my. He did two two huge things for me. He did that and he expanded unemployment benefits when I lost my job um, mm -hmm. uh, during the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom's mm -hmm. diabetic, and like it's just like I'm just like thank God that like insurance companies can't reject her yeah. for, for being diabetic. Yeah. And I remember that my insurance was $900 before right. the, a month before the Affordable Care Act went to originally like 160 and is now like close to 400, but that's still better than 900. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I, I mean, there, it's like all of this is true, right? Like good things happen under presidents, but at the same time under Obama, we started a war in Yemen that is a complete, gen literally totally, a genocide totally, right totally, now. Totally, totally, Like if you actually totally. look at any details of Yemen, you, it's like you start crying, yeah, but dude. Again, like, it's again, really fun. again, unemployment benefits. Yeah, that's what um. I'm saying. So it's all, you know what I mean? Like it's all uh, like no. this. It's all like this. And the other thing is like for me, like this is my, my personal opinion is like, I think Trump should be impeached, but for war crimes, essentially. I think he's committed, like Yemen is one, and then he's basically committed a series of war crimes since he's been in office. And it's very clear, but it seems to be celebrated by everybody instead it's, of like, it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's tough. It's, it, I, think the, I think the big challenge for politicians in impeaching any president for war crimes is then you have to kind of look at every president ever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, wanna be. you gotta find the bad thing they did that everyone else didn't do. Right, right. Which, which, which is also why corruption is hilarious. You know, right? <laughs> the allegation of corruption is also pretty hilarious because I'm like, come on, guys, really. But <laughs> I think so. In a way, I do think like yes, Trump attacked America, but but in the sense that it's a mirror that we saw and we're like, ah, is that what we look like? Is that us? Like, you know what I mean? It's the existential crisis. I'm not even saying courage. we don't deserve him. I'm just saying yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. deserve him. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. But I'm just um, saying from the point of view of the Yemeni kid who has now sworn a blood oath against all Americans because absolutely, his family is dead. Absolutely, absolutely, like, absolutely. he does not care. You know what I mean? It's like, so it's all, the absolutely. perspective, is, the perspective absolutely. is fascinating. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll say interesting thing about Hillary. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm two-time Bernie voter in the primaries. Oh, and, you uh, poor, you poor sucker. <laughs> you poor guy. You poor uh, guy. Yeah. And I'll, I'll vote for whoever the candidate. I, I'm, I'm just that. For, I'm just like, all right, next. Well, what's what are the what are the choices now? Um, but <sighs> but yeah. Hillary. But I think I think what's interesting is I'm I'm sure Hillary would have been as bad a president as like everyone before her in the same ways. 
But I think there are things that people like to point out about her as being bad that make me think she might have actually been good. Uh -huh. For example, lots of people love to play that video of her laughing after Gaddafi was killed. Uh, that oh, yeah, he did. Right, uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just kind of like, if I'm like Putin or Xi Jinping or something, that video is terrifying to me. That woman is terror. That's like the last person I want as an enemy of the United States to see become the president of the United States. Trump yeah. is like a godsend to me oh, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm them. So I'm just like, I'm like, you know, just the idea of having someone who like, you know, threatens to knock you out and then sh has, sh has a history of knocking people out. I think her word and threat and like in dealings with other countries, there's a legitimate strength there that right. people like to ascribe to Trump, which is real. Right. Um, I think yeah. I too, I too prefer murderers to crooks, you know, when it comes to our <laughs> leaders, you know, <laughs> like crooks, come on, anybody but is, can steal. But is Trump not a murderer? It's just like, it's just like. Well, he is now. It's I mean, like now, Hitler, I mean, he definitely I'm, I'm is just, now. I'm convinced Hitler would have way preferred Trump be the president of the United States than FDR. Po possibly, but Hitler was also like, you know, I don't know, do, are we going by his judgment in here? <laughs> like, are we using him <laughs> as the yardstick of judgment? No, no, what I'm do you saying, think, Hitler? going you know, like, against his judgment. I'm saying right. he, like, you know. Oh, you think I, Hitler would be, I like, I like this Trump guy. I like, I, I prefer I the Trump guy. guy. I think I prefer him Trump I can get along I like with. It. I like Trump, <laughs> I like it. Well, did you know that um, uh, one of the things I love, uh, I love as a fun historical fact is that um, our, uh, like Jim Crow South was the model for the Nazis for their uh, race laws. So, sure. <laughs> so as much as we were the freedom fighters fighting freedom. Well, like, a huge, you know. a huge problem I think about this country very specifically is like you know you look at how Germany handled post World War II Germany. It's like no Nazi flags, no being a Nazi, no hail Hitlers. That is you're all free outside of that. That's mm -hmm. our, that's our not allowed anymore. Mm -hmm. And then here it's like monuments of, uh, of the Confederates, Confederate flags all over the place. We didn't like bury our racist, like, 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 uh, scar into the ground. We let people celebrate it. And, and, and like, we're looking at somewhat of an ascension of it. I mean, yeah, well, I think uh, for me, I feel like race in our country, our great, our great country, is really like akin to um, a, a grown up having been molested. You know what I mean? Like that's it's 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 in the past. This really terrible thing in the past. Things are kind of different now, but things keep coming up from that past. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and then and they well, come. Because the molested the frequently become molesters. Also, well, also, and the things that come up are sometimes almost incongruous with what's actually the issue. You know what I mean? It's almost like completely out of left field. And you're like, what the fuck? And it's usually because, so it's like, we are a country that hasn't dealt with our issues. You know what I mean? We just haven't. And I think in one way it is like, yeah, those kind of, you know, you have to remember that Confederate shit all popped up during the fucking civil rights era. So it was really the, the, the politics of the time were using those icons and all that shit as weapons, you know what I mean, for their political ends, more so than this, to me, more so than there's something endemic in the culture, you know what I mean? Like, I honestly feel like if you left people alone and pull up politicians and people didn't try to fuck with everybody, like something, something natural would kind of occur where people would just start intermingling based on like, shared you know shared oh, interests it's definitely like that, it's, you know what I mean? it's like, definitely it's definitely a mess of, i mean it's 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 uh what's the thing the window the the what's that term called? overton window oh the overton window yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean the overton window it's it just like it's just like our politics pushes so hard to every extreme to kind yeah. of reach that overton window that it divides so hard um but i mean like rationality puts it, it, but both both sides are counting on rationality to push the Overton window uh, further to but their see, side. I don't think they are anymore. I think both sides have opted for pro wrestling. Like totally. they literally, well, I've, that's, I've been I think thinking, they've... I'll tell you like my biggest fear right now about about the coronavirus. It's these goddamn open. No, um, it's yeah. uh, <laughs> it's um, my biggest fear about uh, about coronavirus is that. 
things are going to legitimately taper off somewhat just by nature of summertime and, and, um, and like us coming up with some strategy where we're able, I mean, it's hard for me, uh, me to believe our government's going to come up with some strategy, but we do like just something that makes it like sort of reopen. Mm -hmm. But then come fall, come September, there's going to be a huge spike mm -hmm. and it's going to get real bad. And, and we're going to be two months away from the election and it's going to become just a political thing of, the Democrats are trying to say that this is so bad again and it's really not any worse versus the Democrats maybe making it sound worse than it actually is because that's just the side they're on and no one's going to know who to believe about what. I mean, I'm just going to lie. I down. feel like it's already but like that, don't you? It, don't you it feel is like already it's like currently that. like that right now? It is, it is currently like that right now, but like the closer it gets to November, the worse it's going to get. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll see. I mean, I, I um, there's so many possibilities at this point. Like another great possibility is that uh, a genuine financial collapse, like economic financial collapse, that just comes from the shutdown itself. You know what I mean? Like where it's like, uh oh, we accidentally like there's food riots now, not just because we can't get food. You know, there's like supply chains fucked up. People are starting to be hungry. People have no work. People have no food. People have that. You know what I mean? It's starting to get to a point where it's like, and then and then and then on top of that, you, a bunch of them get sick. But I think at that point, that'll be the least of our worries. Honestly, like if it cuts to that point, you're like, you don't. It's like I would rather be sick than I deal just, with like. It's just weird to be living in the possible collapse of America. Right. I mean, it's just, it's but, just but, interesting. Yeah, but I think it's actually always. Yeah, this is going back to my original point of being old. Um, as an old guy, this has been sort of. Um, it's a chain, it's a chain of events you can actually take all the way back to FDR, like basically to, to the first, Second World War, like to, to like the Second World War and basically what You can America take it all did. the way back to the Civil War. Yeah, 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 yeah. but I know you can take it back to amoebas, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, but, but I'm just it's talking about- I'm, I'm a determinist. I'm a, I'm, a so, <laughs> I'm a soft determinist. Soft determinist, so some free will, some free some will. Some free will. Some free will. Like, yeah. uh, what do you mean? Like uh under some circumstances there's free will inside of a box or something or what do you mean what is that uh, i think i think the future is is um hypothesisable <laughs> if that oh, makes sense okay yeah uh but, but that that could be a deterministic construct yes you know what i mean right okay that's yeah. like all according to the program but we could be like hmm what's gonna happen and then make different choices within people can make different choices that's very make even keeled for such a blue-blooded liberal, uh, no, <laughs> for somebody who bleeds blue, <laughs> that's very. But I, uh, I don't, I don't even bleed blue. Like I, I, know, I know, I know. I'm just that's so it's it's it's. I just I feel like I'm just practical. I just I like like I feel like I just accept what the reality of my every moment is and try to do the best thing I can do in that moment. I mean, and it's funny. It's funny when Trump won. The next day, I called my parents. I was like, "I'm moving to New Zealand," and they were like, "Don't, don't, don't be ridiculous, Josh." But like, if I look, how I would be laughing all the way to the open bank right now if I was in New Zealand. I would be laughing all the way to the disease-free, fully operational bank if I was in New Zealand right now instead of instead of here. Like, like. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think like, uh, honestly, in some ways, I, I mean, like, I'm no fan of Trump, but the one thing I do appreciate is everybody hating the president. Cause I don't think it's like, I feel like it's dangerous when everything, everybody thinks the president is cool. You know what I mean? Cause then they can just start doing stuff and nobody's like calling them out. You know what I mean? Like, they, it's like, I like the idea that there's uh, animosity, that there's some contention between the public and the fucking head of state, you know what I'm saying? And that there should be between the media. Honestly, I think the media and Trump, it's actually just a big old Well, well the, like, biggest, the biggest problem is like, I'd be fine to hate Trump if like, you just, you know, I'd, I'd still hate Trump if he was less powerful. I'd still hate Trump if he didn't yeah. have the Senate. Yeah, yeah, Trump is, um, I never liked the guy. He, but here's the thing, we still, we've been wanting healthcare. They've been talking about giving people healthcare since FDR, <laughs> since the new deal, you know what I'm saying? That's sure. actually so the, the so the biggest indictment of this country to me is that yeah we're in the middle of a huge health crisis and 
our healthcare for most people is dependent on their employees and we just shut down all that down so they don't even have that anymore like where to go geniuses like what what you know what i mean like uh, it's like to me it's like it, it's to me the head of state is important to blame and, and all these people but it's like they could the fucking the motherfuckers could have given us health care well i mean the, yeah the, absolutely i think but i think another huge aspect and i think a huge pro a huge like like I, I let me count the ways in which in which this current government was always going to the what the current administration was always going to fuck this up wildly is every decision that trump makes is is based on how it affects him personally mm -hmm. and it's caused i think like 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 what really needed to happen was just at the very beginning of all this let's say let's say it was a democrat or somebody else in charge and they didn't they didn't respond to it until the same point trump responded to it what literally needed to happen was a committed plan that goes into effect that is like this is what we are doing this is what we are doing. And just uh -huh. you you commit to doing the thing you plan to doing. Every day there's a new plan. Right. Every day. So there is no plan. Right. There's just pure chaos and things have gotten 0% better. I would um, say, listen, honest, obviously, I, there's no way I'm gonna be like, Trump did a good job. Okay? Like, <laughs> okay, but, but I guess my whole point is that like, um, uh, okay, we are unfortunately in a climate where just imagine if Trump, before any of this was even news, just was like, I am locking down our borders. <laughs> you know, I'm restricting travel from Asia. I mean, when he did the little he did, he he did get attacked by Puerto It's okay, funny, okay. it's funny. So, I said when, when coronavirus was like first starting, actually one of the few things I said is I go, well, at least Trump will probably lock down our borders. Yeah, that yeah. Was and, <laughs> you know what? And in retrospect, that is not, it's okay to be like, hey, maybe we should have done that. You know, without it being like, you now you love Trump. And I, you know, like, so I, I did. But, I, but I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll give you sort of a further macro reason why I think, um, why Trump's terrible. Because Trump has put our, con has, has, has been such a, symbol of racism and xenophobia that his decision to shut down our borders will always in some people's minds be born out of a place of racism and xenophobia versus a president who doesn't have that strong a correlation to him doing something like that can be looked at as a rational decision right um, but, more yeah, so more yeah. so not that but there I, wouldn't be pushback but like if right. obama was like look we're locking down our borders there's a pandemic i think there would be pushback, but a lar much, much, much larger percentage of people would be like, well, this is probably the proof. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think he is as much to blame as everybody else in Washington, because I think there's, there's actually a lot of evidence that people in Capitol Hill knew about this shit, like as far back totally. as like- the, uh, the insider like, trading stuff. Yeah, the insider just... trading thing. Feinstein was one of it, you know what I mean? So it's bipartisan, fuck, fuck it's Feinstein. not like a- fuck yeah, Feinstein. But I'm just saying like, yeah. I, and if they knew, other people knew. And that means while that was going on, they were going through the whole impeachment trial. They were doing this whole impeachment thing. And this, that was always going on instead of being like, hey, maybe we should stop this and actually deal with this. There's possibly a pandemic. You know what I mean? Like they, they had info. They had info. So I don't know. I just feel like everybody, there's a lot of people to blame. Like if you really did a postmortem, of course, I, like, sure, like sure. I said, I'm not defending the guy. Sure. I'm just saying. I'll just say, I mean, you know, Obama said the buck stops here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and Obama drank the water in Flint like this. He the buck like, stops there. He, 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 oh. he is he is the bad guy mm. for doing. He is the bad guy for that situation. He is yeah, that's absolute. what I'm saying. So you know, so, absolutely. So honestly, absolutely. I feel like the president's job really is to be either the baby face or the heel for the public while all the other shit goes on behind, you know what I'm saying? While the military does the complex, or whatever the, all the money and all the power behind it. It just seems like face. this all could have gone down differently. This it, all, this, I do, this I believe all that could be in a much better yes. place than it is now. I could like, you know, I just, honestly, whatever, whatever you think, like, like, why not at this point, yeah, honestly, legitimately, why not just see how senile Joe Biden does? <laughs> why not just see? Why not just see if it's better than this? 
I mean, I don't know. I don't think anything can be better than this. <laughs> I think a, it, I think things can be. Time. I think things can be better. I think it can be better to have the president at least wearing a mask in public, so people see wear a mask. Um, oh, I thought you meant the lizard mask. Because <laughs> 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 I feel like that's really the main criticism of Trump is like, man, he fucking took his lizard mask off. <laughs> now showing everybody <laughs> what a monster we are. You know, it's like, he should have, how dare it? We want him, the president should be like this, like, not like that. Ah, you know, like, and I feel like, honestly, though, I don't know. That's why, to me, what I enjoy is the, the sort of hypocrisy of the sideshow of like, yeah, this guy sucks, but you guys have done shitty shit while acting like you're good. So I don't know. You all suck. Now you all suck. To me. We all, we all, everybody we all, sucks. We, everyone, everyone sucks. I, I, I've never agreed with something more. <laughs> everyone sucks, but some people suck less than others. Sure. That's fine. And I don't know. Let God sort that out. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's not, that shouldn't be up to me. <laughs> like, so I, I'm one of them. I suck too. Like, you know what well, I mean? Well, like, part of me is, part of me is like, let, part of me is like, let me try to get to New Zealand as soon as I can because it'll e be easier for me to get back into America if Biden wins than out when Trump wins again. <laughs> What would be hilarious if you went to New Zealand and you ended up being the asymptomatic patient zero <laughs> that started the new outbreak. Oh, oh, lock me, lock me, lock me in a, lock me in a bubble for two months. And you're like, oh, this I'll fucking Amer these fucking Americans, man. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll go, I'll go in a bubble. Just put me in a bubble for however long it takes to. Hey, man, it's probably a beautiful <laughs> bubble. New Zealand is beautiful. Like, yeah. it would still be a nice time. Um, all right, Josh. Hey, man, we should wrap this up. Thank you so much for fucking doing this, man. It was Dude, it's super time. fun. I've been, I've, been, I've been looking forward to it. I've been looking forward yeah, to it. Man. Well, I'm glad you were able to do it today instead of... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Um, what's the name of your podcast? Just for the uh, people... Quarantine. 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 I, re I really leaned hard in, into it. But you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, cool. Podbean. And what's um, the name of uh, your movie that's coming out? That Mentally Al. Mentally Al, look for that coming up. Um, I'll be yeah. repost and, and you can also watch my web series, Best Friends Web Series, on YouTube or my Instagram account. Yes, nice. nice. Um, Hell yeah. Josh Edelman, everybody. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you so much. Rudy. Oh, yeah, and I guess follow me at the Edelmeister. There you oh, go. There I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, wait, so say that again. At the Edelmeister. At Twitter, the Edelmeister. Twitter, Instagram. Instagram. Josh Edelman. Facebook. Uh, oh, fuck this. <laughs> Fuck Facebook. Fuck Facebook. Um, all right. Thanks so much, man. Super fun chat. Thanks for having me, buddy. All right. Great job. Great. Bye.